just jump right in and tell me why you wrote a book about forgiveness at this time and at this point in your career. Well, first, every minister has to talk about forgiveness constantly. Um, it's not only comes up in the Bible all the time, it's at the heart of the gospel, that is God's forgiveness of us. Uh, it's, you know, in the, as you know, because I said it in the book a couple of times, in the Lord's Prayer, the only statement that Jesus repeats is, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then at the end of the prayer, Jesus adds, and if you do not forgive, you know, other people, then there's no reason why God should forgive you. And and so it's very, very central uh, to what the Bible teaches. It's also extremely practical. You cannot do marriage counseling as a pastor without talking about forgiveness. Uh, you can't do uh, you know, relationship repair. So it's very practical. So the real question is, though, why, why I read a book? And I actually think that we've got a bit of a cultural crisis going on right now. And I think... Uh, for various reasons, when I explain them in the book, uh, younger people are actually uncomfortable with the idea of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to do it, and they're not even sure they should do it. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why the subtitles are, why should I and how can I? I think the reason they question it is because the emphasis of young people on doing justice is important, and forgiveness seems to be at var it seems to be uh, contradict justice. It seems like, well, I can forgive or I can pursue justice. Mm -hmm. That's one problem. And then secondly, um, we live in a culture where that people don't do face-to-face -face stuff. Uh, I, I talked to a woman some time ago, I think I actually mentioned this in the book, maybe. No, I probably don't. Uh, who's a dean of students for women in a college. And she said, now don't, don't quote me, because I'm quoting her, but I'm not quoting who she is. Don't quote me. She says an enormous, uh, we're here to try to help women with their um, problems as women, whether it's discrimination or adjustment to college. But it's astounding the percentage of women who come into our office looking for help in which basically they don't know how to break up. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to break up with a guy. They, they're not used to it. All they know how to do is just stop texting or not answer that they don't do face to face. And yet if you're dating somebody or seeing somebody or whatever the word would be now, uh, they they don't know what to do. They don't know how to deal with uh, conflict or disagreement. So partly younger people in particular don't know that they should forgive. And if they even if they feel they should, they don't know how to do it. So I felt like to me it was a what the Bible says anyway. So we should do it. We should talk about things that I should write as a minister about things the Bible speaks about. But B, there's a cultural moment here where I think forgiveness is very important to talk about. Mm -hmm. So we live in a culture that's very fragmented, polarized. There's an awful lot of anger. People are really after each other. Uh, there's there, the Forgiveness is not in the air. And so that's why I wrote it. Yeah. Well, yeah, you talk about how this idea of forgiveness is under attack right now, especially in some of these current movements like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and, and cancel culture. So talk more about this idea that forgiving and pursuing justice do have to go hand in hand and how you can't really have one without the other. Well, the nutshell, and this won't be enough, I'll try to explain a little bit, but in a nutshell, you can, we can say, I try to say, that if you, <clears throat> you don't, you you do need to forgive if you're going to pursue justice. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, oh, I can forgive or pursue justice, no. You need to forgive in order to pursue justice because if you don't forgive, all you'll be pursuing is vengeance. Mm -hmm. And now at a, at a um, uh, it means that your all your motivation will tend to be anger. And I'm really not sure that anger, anger is more exhausting than love. Mm -hmm. uh, as an emotion <laughs> anger spends you love builds you up uh anger can twist you in fact did you know i think i mentioned it in the book that the that the the english word wrath and wreath and wraith means twisted it's an old anglo-saxon word that means twisted and so the the old english word for wrath meant to be twisted up and of course you feel that way when you're angry mm -hmm. And if that's the main reason you're going to try to do justice, 
Um, I think it, it, you, you will overreach. You'll often, uh, when you're talking to people that you think are doing injustice, you won't persuade them or win them over. You'll just denounce them. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, you'll make them worse because they'll feel like I've got to, you know, I've got to protect myself. Uh, but, you know, actually, even at a very, very basic level, let's just say a friend of yours has done something wrong uh, to you and really hurt you and you want to go talk to them about it. If I forgive that person in my heart and say, Lord, you've forgiven me. I live only by your, only by your forgiveness. And so I don't have any right to hold a grudge when, you know, you, you've forgiven me. So help me to forgive. Now, that doesn't mean you get rid of all your anger, but it helps some. Mm -hmm. So that when you go to talk to the person, why are you confronting the person? One, you're confronting them because you, you care about them. Um, you don't want them to keep doing this behavior. You think it'll hurt them. B, you're thinking about other victims. You don't want this person to do it to other people. C, you're thinking about God. You want to honor God and, because, and what this person has done was wrong. And so you have all kinds of good and loving reasons for going in and, and confronting him. But if you don't forgive, the reason you'll be confronting that person is you're basically trying to make them feel bad, mm -hmm. just like they made you feel bad. You're paying them back. You're, you're, you're telling them off and letting them know and basically trying to make them feel bad. And you know how they're going to respond? They're not going to say, oh, yeah, I really need to change. No, they're going to they're, they're going to get their back up and they're going to say, well, yeah, but you did this and you did that. And and instead of, frankly, getting the person to see what they've done wrong, you're actually going to entrench them where they are. So. The basic idea is, unless you forgive and pursue justice together, you actually won't pursue justice. Um, I, I really appreciated how you touch on what forgiveness is not, because I think sometimes in the church, and you talk about how sometimes in the church, we've seen abusers be restored back to positions of power yeah. because of this idea of turn the other cheek. Yeah. Talk about some of the misconceptions we've historically had in the church about forgiveness. Well, it's interesting. So, for example, um, now I don't think I bring this up in the book, but it's just it's just coming now to me. Uh, Moses, you know, God tells Moses to go out and speak to the rock and uh, and he'll bring water out of the rock for the people. And Moses instead, instead of going and doing what God wants, he gets angry at them and says, why do I have to do this and hits the rock? And basically disobeys God. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically what God says afterwards is you're, I forget in other words, you know, he disobeys God. What's the wages of sin? Death. So obviously God doesn't slay Moses. You know, he forgives Moses, but there's consequences because Moses does not lead them into the promised land. Mm -hmm. And it's because of, you know, the, some places where he failed uh, and it's, I think it's perfectly fair to say just to forgive somebody does not mean that person automatically should be restored exactly to where they were. Mm -hmm. They may have undermined people's confidence in them. They may have uh, made it difficult for people to trust them. In fact, I don't, I, to forgive somebody does not mean you have to trust them. I think trust comes back gradually. Mm -hmm. um, what you want to you want to give people the chance to re-earn the trust. I mean, I don't think it's right to cut the person off and say, I want nothing to do with you ever. Mm -hmm. I think if you forgive a person, you need to be letting them, you know, seeing them. And yet there's no reason why you, you can't trust them little by little and then have the trust grow back. Um, to forgive somebody doesn't mean you have to trust them. Maybe they haven't changed or maybe they haven't changed fast enough. And you never, it's never loving to make it easy for a person to sin against you. Yeah. It's never loving to make it easy for a person to sin against you. So um, I think the Bible shows that the uh, same thing with David after Bathsheba, he was forgiven. He wasn't slain by God, but on the other hand, there were consequences. Uh, and the consequences were rather natural consequences from what he had done. Um, and I, I actually said, therefore, it's quite wrong when there's an abuse in the church, say sexual abuse, where a youth worker, you know, uh, comes on and touches a, you know, a, a, a student or a, a, you know, a kid in the youth group. And then when it's all, when it comes out for the church to come and say to the man, you know, you did wrong. And so oh, I repent, he says, I repent. And then to go to the girl and her family and say, you need to forgive him now because he repented. 
Yeah. And and uh, they just keep put him right back into his job. And this has happened a lot. Yeah. And there's no consequences. And actually, it's a way of kind of silencing the person, uh, the, the victim. One thing you have to keep in mind is that is, uh, in most places, an actual crime. It's not just a sin. You know, there's a lot of sins that aren't crimes, by the way. Thank goodness. <laughs> because we'd all be in jail all the time. But there's... Uh, when when the church covers up a, not, a sin that's also a crime, mm -hmm. you know, against the civil government, and it uh, shows no consequences, then you're using what you're basically you are using forgiveness in an unbiblical way as a weapon against victims, mm -hmm. and that's another reason, by the way, why in the evangelical church there is a lot of uh, distrust of all the talk about forgiveness. I do know that in the '70s and '80s, and I was there because I was. You know, I was a minister and leader in the 70s and 80s. There was a tendency on the part of evangelical churches to feel like all we have to do is get people to repent and forgive and not go outside to the world. Right. We can solve everything. And I get that. I mean, it first, first Corinthians 6 talks, talks about not, Christians not suing each other in court. In other words, don't go to court, you know, work this out between you and the church. Well, that I understand. Mm -hmm. Two people, instead of suing one another, you know, they, that should be worked out. But when it comes to uh, a, an actual, you know, uh, child abuse or sexual abuse or or uh, wife abuse, these things are against the law. And if you are only think oh, we, we don't want to go out there, we're going to just deal with it right in here, then it really is very bad for victims. So I had to I had to talk about that in the book. Yeah. I, that doesn't get rid of the necessity of forgiveness, but you're right in asking me about it because we have to admit that the evangelical churches use that as a weapon against victims. And that's another reason why it's been discredited to some degree. Do you see, you, you said that you've seen sort of a hesitancy of, of young people, especially to forgive. Are you seeing that in the church and in the secular world as well? Yes, I think what we tend to do is we just leave. Yeah um we we it, it, it's it's actually something we've learned on social media you just drop out you just you just you know what they'll say that you ghost mm -hmm. you just actually stop texting them you stop getting back and i think we actually do the same thing in the church mm -hmm. that if we have a problem we just we just leave one actually one of the things we used to do at redeemer because we had so many single people Redeemer at one point was like 90% single. We had a thousand people coming, if you can believe that. Uh, but the good thing was we had multiple church services. So we'd have two in the morning, two in the evening, that kind of. And what happened a lot, and there's nothing wrong with this exactly, is that sometimes Christians would start to see each other, and a guy, a man, a woman would start seeing each other. And then it didn't work out, and they'd break up, and they both felt kind of hurt. And they tended to say, well, I can't go to this church anymore. Mm -hmm. And we used to say, well, you know, obviously you certainly can leave a church and go to another church. But if this is the place where you're growing and where your community is and your friends are, um, first of all, you, it would be better to forgive the other person. Because usually when they broke up, both sides felt the other person didn't quite do them right. So you say, look, forgive. You don't have to be close friends, but learn to forgive and you don't have to go to the same service, go to a different service. But eventually you have to get back to the place where you can see the person and not bother you so much. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we say in the book, forgiveness is granted before it's felt. Right. And, and you shouldn't expect that forgiveness means I have no anger or no unhappiness. No, I mean, you, you, you grant the forgiveness and it, I think the, the emotions come later. So the nice thing about us is we, we had a lot of this. We say, go to a different service, you know, stick with your friends, work on your heart. Uh, it doesn't mean there aren't any other good churches in town. We weren't saying that. But on the other hand, there's no good reason to uproot yourself just over something like this. You ought to, you know, you need to forgive the other person and, and move on. So uh, I do think that uh, even back 30 or 40 years ago, younger single people tended to just say, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Rather than work on, you know, if there was a conflict uh, or uh, falling out. Uh, it doesn't have to just be breaking up, by the way. I mean, very often you have friends that just really rub each other the wrong way or, you know, say, um, uh, you know, for, it, one of the best ways to kill a friendship, as you know, is uh, uh, betray a confidence. 
Mm -hmm. So somebody tells you a kind of secret or something like that, and then you tell it to somebody else and they find out about it and they feel like, how dare you do that? Well, those are, those, I hate to say, those are run of the mill, ordinary things that people do do with each other. You can't have a, you know, you can't have a sustained marriage if you don't find your, if you don't know how to forgive. Right. And forgiving does mean not just covering it up, but talking about it, uh, you know, and then, you know, forgiving, getting past it. Uh, so it's really important that we learn it in the church. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do it in your marriage. You're not going to be able to do it in a lot of other places. You need to really do it just, just to keep the relationship going. Yeah, definitely. Well, you write that resources for healing relationships and strengthening community are being eliminated by therapeutic culture. And I thought this was really interesting because these ideas of acquiring inner peace, um, happiness comes first, living your best life, your truth. These are all concepts that are really pervasive, especially in women's ministry. And we see it a lot in the, the church. Um, how do we distinguish between some of these faulty ideas presented in therapeutic culture um, and what's actually biblical? Yeah, that one's a hard one because um, <clears throat> uh, there's overlap. In other words, some of the, some of the stuff on forgive so that you can get past your anger and so you can have a happy life um is uh let go of your anger let go of it uh there's overlap between that and what the bible says you do have to forgive and not you know what i usually say um that people say well, what does it mean to forgive i say to forgive is a promise to not throw the the, the thing that happened to not bring it up constantly to the person, to not bring it up constantly to other people, which is slander and gossip, but also not to keep bringing it up to yourself, which is, you know, uh, brooding on it. And if you if you catch yourself when you want to talk to other people about it, or want to talk to the person about it, or want to talk to yourself about it, if you stop yourself doing that, you are granting forgiveness. You're not trying to pay them back either by making them feel bad or by hurting their reputation with somebody else, or even by sticking little pins in them in their, in your heart. If you do that, um, you'll start to actually get more inner peace. You'll let go of your anger. Now the therapeutic approach basically likes that. In mm -hmm. other words, they, they would take that part of my book and say, that's great. But the real question is the goal. The goal should be, um, love for God and your neighbor which is where all the Ten Commandments, you know, all hinges on love for God and your neighbor. Not just, I need to be happy. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if, 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 the, if the main purpose of forgiveness is how do I get happy, um, you're not doing all the forgiveness actually should do. I think what forgiveness is supposed to do is not only give you inner peace, but make you an agent of reconciliation in the world, make it possible for you to handle conflict make it possible for you to, uh, like, like I said, um, uh, you know, eventually if you break up, be able to see the other person mm -hmm. and even be able to see the other person say with another man or woman, that kind of thing. And you're, so you are trying to get to the place where you, you can have, uh, you, you can reconcile relationships. And that's what I try to say in the book is that the, the therapeutic model, it's all about me. Mm -hmm. It's not about what honors God, and what what creates more human community? It's just about me, and uh, and yet, frankly, there's overlap. Like I said, there's a uh, most of the stuff that I would tell people, the therapist might tell them too. That's they would probably say that's great. That's a great way of letting go of your anger. You know, I used to say, you know, forgiveness is granted before it's felt, and the way you grant it is, like I just said, uh, it's a commitment to not bring it up constantly to the person, to other people, or to yourself. And that way, eventually, your anger will start to diminish. Uh, but see, here's the vertical, and the therapeutic doesn't have it at all, Leah. The vertical is, I can do this because, honestly, I'm a sinner, and yet Christ forgave me at great cost to himself. And as a result, I really don't have the right to hold anybody else like liable. Mm -hmm. And what that does is that gets, that's an enormous, it's a humbling thing. And at the same time, to say you're a forgiven sinner means, on the one hand, you're a sinner, which means you know you're no nobody's you're no better than anybody else. But you're forgiven, you're loved. Mm -hmm. 
And so if you have, you already have a kind of inner peace from the Lord. And you're supposed to use that inner peace on forgiveness, whereas the therapeutic model gets rid of the vertical. There's no mention of God. It's all about, in a sense, getting your mind off of the past. It's a little, it worries me a little bit. It's a little bit like mind control. It, don't think about it. Don't think about them. You know, think nice thoughts. Uh, remind yourself of what a good person you are. Uh, so it, 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 it gets rid of the vertical and it actually even gets rid of the, um, the external. We're not trying to reconcile with anybody and we're not drawing on God. We're all about making ourselves feel better. That's all. It, 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 in some ways, it looks a little bit like the, the whole idea of Christian, ther of Christian forgiveness, excuse me, is your vertical relationship and forgiveness from God enables you to internally get rid of your anger so that you can externally be an agent of reconciliation. The therapeutic model tries to have that middle part without the other two parts, and I'm not sure it works. Uh, because I try to say there are two kinds of forgiveness that look, they're secular versions, and they, they, uh, they're kind of at loggerheads. So one was a therapeutic approach, which is, doesn't care about anything other than my inner peace. The other is uh, what I call a merited forgiveness approach, which is you go to the person and say, I'll forgive you, but you've got you've to clean up your act. You've got to, you basically have to grovel. Mm -hmm. And you have to, um, uh, I've seen a lot of that, by the way, online, where people, women say, uh, I'm supposed to forgive the person who assaulted me or molested me. And I can't forgive unless that person would, would admit it and come out and do all that, then I could forgive. And, and that's been criticized as almost the opposite, where you are, um, the therapeutic approaches, don't go to the person, don't talk to them, it's all about you. Mm -hmm. the, the merited forgiveness approach is actually almost a form of revenge. Yeah. You know, you're saying, oh, I'll forgive you, but you have to do X, Y, Z. It's basically using, you're, you're coercing the person, you're, you're holding it over them and trying to control them. And by the way, there are plenty of marriages where I've seen that. If, um, uh, especially, I don't, it's not all one way, but if a woman or a man mess up, if sometimes they, instead, very often the spouse will hold that over them forever. Mm-hmm. Hold it over them forever. Um, I'm actually fairly recently just talked to a um, a um, you know a bit, but they're they're actually they're not really a Christian couple. What the woman is kind of a Christian, the man's not. Uh, I had a counsel them on the phone, and what was interesting years ago, uh, she before she became a Christian had an affair. And um, this guy, the, the husband, who is not a believer, uh, used it on her all the time. Basically, they, they stayed together. But whenever he really, you know, was angry at her, he would pull it out and use it to hit her with. Basically, you did this and you were unfaithful. And, that's what and then what happened was he did the same thing mm. because he got drunk and sort of did it at a party. And uh, he's still not a believer. I was trying to counsel on the phone and he says, you know, now I don't have the right I can't, I can't use that anymore because we both done it. And I said, you never should have, <laughs> you know, I, I'm trying to evangelize, but I'm also trying to say that just was wrong. You know, you, you really hurt your marriage. You have a long way to go to make it better. Uh, I'm glad that you see that you're a sinner too. I said, this is kind of a Christian message. I said to him, uh, but the point is that you, you, you really are, I'm, I'm urging him to become a Christian to say you are a sinner. I said, if you both see yourself as sinners, but forgiven, it'll really help you forgive each other constantly instead of, you know, he just wasn't able to forgive her until he did something wrong mm. himself. Then he wanted her to forgive him. And she said, I want you to talk to Tim and Kathy Keller. Yeah. And so we got on the phone and talked to him and it's a way of trying to help him. He wants to stick with the marriage, but it's, it's all been about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. All been about forgiveness. And it's basically been trying to explain to him, you're, you were a sinner before you ever got drunk and, you know, kind of did something with a woman at a party. Uh, and, you, and if you knew you were a sinner, you wouldn't have been beating your wife up over what she did years ago. And your marriage would be in a much better place. So we're, you know, he wants to stay together. So, you know, we're urging him. I said, you can't become a Christian just because you want to stay your marriage. You have to do it because it's right, true, and Jesus exists. But I said, on the other hand, if you want to save your marriage, you ought to at least take a good look at Christianity because yeah. it's really the way forward. So anyway. Yeah. But you're, you're probably right that men 
are not given the same kind of emphasis. Maybe they people maybe people think no men it's more masculine to stay angry and women are supposed to be forgiving, which is a problem, by the way. I mean, the idea that women are supposed to be forgiving men or not, that's just totally, totally unbiblical. Mm -hmm. There is no gender difference on that at all. In the, the, the Bible, you know, everything the Bible says is for men and women. It never says, you know, forgive one another as Christ forgave you, especially if you're a woman. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that. That's Ephesians 4.32. It just says, forgive others the way christ forgave you yeah no that's 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 very helpful well and this book is very practical and you spend a good bit of time talking about how we can practice forgiveness so outline some of these daily disciplines that we can do to to truly get to a place of forgiveness well um i think one of the things you have to ask yourself very often people would say oh that person i i you know i've forgiven that person but sometimes you can do a little bit of an inventory and say, do you avoid the person? Mm -hmm. Do you kind of talk them down? Especially, by the way, is there anybody out there that when you find out something not so good has happened to them, you really go, yes. So, I mean, that that shows you've got it in. Uh, you have to, especially, by the way, I mean, even with public figures, I mean, there are some public figures, politicians, people like that, that you really don't like. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. I mean, why why should you? I mean, and yet if you find that if they get humbled or something bad happens to them and you um you know, you actually enjoy it. That's a very bad sign that that you probably got have a, a root of bitterness in your heart. And that's even true for public figures, but especially if there's people in your life that you know, maybe your relatives, people in your family, people in your church, and you really love to see people if they're brought down or they have something bad happen to them, if you like that, that's a very bad sign. So do an inventory. That's one thing you can do is occasionally say, do I have anything against anybody? Because if Jesus asks you to do that in Matthew 5, if you're standing at the altar, he says, and you know that anybody has anything against you, he says, drop your gift and go and make it right. That's a very interesting passage there. See, he's not even saying, do you have anything against anybody? He's actually saying, do you have anybody that actually has a problem with you? And you should go and try to talk to them. And that shows that Jesus is saying, do an inventory. Where are your relationships not what they ought to be? Mm -hmm. Where are you avoiding people or people are avoiding you? And that's, by the way, that's a very uncomfortable discipline. Yeah. Because very often, you know, there's somebody that you just, and you really don't want to go there. But I mean, Jesus... Matthew, if you put Matthew 5 and 18 together, in Matthew 5, he says, if you know somebody's got something against you, go and talk to them about it. And Matthew 18 says, if you have something against somebody, go and talk to them about it, which means it's always your move. Yeah. Which is really frightening. Um, but I actually think the, the most important thing you can do to make yourself a forgiver is to repent of your sins regularly. Um, I try, for example, every Saturday or Sunday, one day or the other, um, I've got certain sins that I tend to repeat. Mm -hmm. Certain ways, cer certain things I don't do right in my marriage, uh, certain things I uh, uh, don't do right, and I tend to fall into those sins. And uh, everybody sins, but everybody's got certain characteristic sins. And I've got a, a few of them, and every, every Saturday or Sunday, I look at them, see how they grieve god i mean even if i haven't really done anything lately in which i was doing it i still um i i basically give i give a uh sustained amount of time to repenting and confessing my sins and looking at my life and showing seeing the places where i'm falling short and basically that's what prepares you to forgive other people is you going and getting forgiveness from God and weeping and crying and thanking him for it and realizing, you know, that I, that, he, that only because of what Jesus has done, are you, are you, does he, is he able to give you this incredible mercy? And I still think that the two main disciplines is every so often look your life over like Matthew 5 and 18 asks you to do and ask yourself about the health of all your relationships. But the other is just become a good repenter yourself. Mm -hmm a good repenter where you're getting forgiveness and then if you are in a position where you have to forgive it won't it won't be hard or at least it won't be as hard if, if we truly understand forgiveness 
how will this impact the way that we view pastors and church leaders who who fail, who uh, typically fall? I would I would look at it the way we I just mentioned with Moses. I really think that um, pastors who who fall now it depends on kind of what they've done, but nevertheless, pastors who uh, have you know fall probably ought to not be the 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 lead pastor in other words i i think there could be a period of repentance and counseling where they got into a certain kind of ministry but generally speaking because they they harm people's trust of them they should say look i really think i've been restored but i'm not going to act as if what i did never happened mm -hmm. and so i'll be in chaplaincy or i'll, I'll uh, i will be on staff of a church or I, th I think after a period of time, a person could maybe remain in ministry, but shouldn't be, I hate to say it like this way, top dog. Mm -hmm. I have seen people who do that. What they do is they they come out and they say, I repented. And then the next thing you know, they're planning a church and they're the top dog. And I thought, you know, God didn't even do that to Moses, even Moses. He, or he said, no, you know, you know what? You, you're you okay for bringing the people to the edge of the promised land, but you're not the guy to bring them in. You, you, because of what you've did, you're not, you're not the one to do that. So I would say pastors who fall should certainly step out of ministry completely, but not just for a few weeks or for even a few months and then come back as if nothing had happened. And that, I do see that happen. I think you need to acknowledge what happened and to say, uh, I can never go back and, and act as if that never happened. Because I, I'm calling people to come and trust me when I've really done something quite wrong, a real breach of covenant, a real breach of trust. So I think the answer would be uh, uh, very often, by the way, a person who's broken down and come back is a pretty good pastor. Mm -hmm. In other they very often, are, they've been humbled. They're actually pretty good at working with other broken people. And they could be on a staff as, as a pastoral person, but probably shouldn't be you know, the main preacher or the main leader. That's what I, that's what I think, especially if there's been a sexual misconduct of some kind uh, or financial misconduct of some kind or something like that. Uh, there are other things that might make a person step down that maybe aren't quite as serious, but, but essentially I would say forgiveness does not mean uh, a complete restoration to exactly where they were before. In fact, it probably generally shouldn't be. Yeah. Okay. How are you health wise? Um, I'm, uh, I, it's, I'm almost exactly where I was two and a half years ago when I got the cancer diagnosis. Every single therapy I've moved to has worked to some degree. In other words, the therapy is keeping pancreatic cancer at bay. And when a particular therapy stops working and it starts to grow, we switch to another one. And, uh, uh, God has been very good because each one has basically worked. It hasn't eradicated it. It's not gone. And we still pray that it would be. But at this point, it's still pretty steady, which means I'm still able to, it's it's intrusive. The, the When I say intrusive, the, the treatments are definitely uh, schedule killers. You know, I can, it, not only do I have to have a lot of things that I do every every three or four weeks, I have scans and tests and things like that. But, but sometimes I have to show up in the hospital and be there for three weeks while they're give me new immunotherapy and things like that so it certainly gets in the way of a lot of things but ultimately i'm still fairly i'm pretty functional so my health is uh it could change anytime i'm amazed you know as you may know pancreatic cancer usually when you get stage four diagnosis uh, most people are gone within months or a year and so i'm still going strong and i'm going into two and a half years so i'm very very grateful to God. So basically, okay, but at the same time, still uh, living from scan to scan and treatment to treatment. 